Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Webinar Series. I'm Marin. I'll be your host for this webinar. In way of announcements, our next webinar will be on the 25th. We won't be having a webinar next Thursday due to finals here at BYU, uh, but we will be returning on the 25th um, to hear about a presentation from James Tanner. Um, next, uh, so that'll be um, at 3 p.m. Mountain Time. And today, um, we are going to be hearing from Todd Knowles, um, and he'll be giving a presentation about the Knowles Collection. Um, during the webinar, if you have any technical problems, please enter your concerns in the chat box, and I can help you out with that. Uh, make sure your video cameras and microphones are disabled. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat box to comment during the webinar. However, all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Um, if you could hold on just a minute while we get things set up, it would be greatly appreciated. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Knowles. I'm a Deputy Chief Genealogical Officer with Family Search, and it's a, it's really nice to be here this afternoon to talk about something dear to my heart, and hopefully something that'll be useful for you, which is the Knowles Collection, and we'll talk about what exactly it is and how do I use it. So what we will discuss today is five things. First, where the Knowles Collection started. We'll talk a little bit about the Morty Collection. We'll talk exactly what is the Knowles Collection and how can it help me. Fourth, we'll talk about the records that are included in the Knowles Collection. And then fifth, and maybe more importantly, how do I access this collection? So let me tell you how it started. It all started when I was 11 years old. And I found out that this man, my great-great-grandfather, was of Jewish descent. I had no idea about this until I filled out my first pedigree chart. And when you see the name Morris David Rosenbaum, immediately it tells you there's a possibility this man could be Jewish. All of my other great-grandfathers, are all, all great-grandparents, I should say, are all pioneer ancestry. This was the one that didn't look like the others, if you will. And so... I saw that name, Morris David Rosenbaum, and I started digging into it. Who is this man? Where did he come from? Where did he come from? The first thing I did is I turned to my grandmother. Well, I, I turned to my father, and he sent me to grandma that she'll know. And so she is his granddaughter, and she is my grandmother. Um, and she started just a couple of questions. What do you want to know about him? And... I said, well, I want to know who he is. I want and something about seeing his name on a pedigree chart just immediately grabbed my heart. You know, we all have that family history story of where it started. Well, he was it. And so she started telling me about him. And over the course of that a full day, she started telling me all the little things about him. And, and very little was really known of original documents. What you see in front of you right now is his passenger list. And believe it or not, it took hours to get it to be that quality that you could read that much. Basically, it says M. Rosenbaum, 19-year-old, a clerk. Morris David Rosenbaum was a Polish Jew. He was born and raised in a place called Forden. It's about a two-hour drive from Warsaw. He was the oldest of seven children, um, the other six all being younger sisters. Well, this was a little farming community he lived in probably not more than four or 500 people total. And he was being raised to be the next rabbi in the community. Uh, very common in these small Jewish communities, they would pick someone or choose someone to be the next rabbi, and they would all work together. Well, how much did they work together? Well, from his own journals, which I now have, he talks about at the age of 19, he knew six different languages. You know, this is farm boy from Poland. So, this is very unusual. Well, what happened next is the uh, family and the, the community decided it was time for him to learn more about the world. If he was going to be the rabbi, you know, he needed to get away from that, that farming mentality, that small little community, and he needed to learn more. So they sent him off on a journey, which they thought would be two or three years, to go see the world and to learn. Well, the very first place they sent him was London. Uh, for many reasons, probably the most simple is it was the easiest transportation in and out. He could get there, then he could sail from there on. 
Well, the problem was of his six languages, English was not one of them. So he got to England and he knew no one there. He'd never been there. He didn't know the language. But he talks in his journals about two families that helped him. One was the Benjamin family and one was the Samuel family. Well, if you've done Jewish research in London, you know that there's hundreds upon hundreds of Benjamin families and Samuel families. So that wasn't really a big hint to us. Well, after about 60 days, 60 to 90 days from his journals, it's kind of hard to say right there. But two to three months, he was in London. Then he set passage for New York City. Well, he got to New York City, and it was kind of a typical Jewish immigrant story. He found some wood in the streets of Manhattan and built a cart out of it. Then he'd get up every morning, go out into the outskirts of town, buy fresh fruits and vegetables, bring them back into Manhattan, and sell them on his cart. Well, it must have been very lucrative because at the end of a month or so, he had six people working for him. And they were all doing the same thing for him. But it dawned on him that his parents sent him out to learn, not to necessarily make a fortune. So that night, he sold everything. And he started and he made his way to Philadelphia. Now, here's a, uh, here's a two-year journey in about uh, 30 seconds. He went from New York to Philadelphia to New Orleans, down to Cuba, down around the Cape of uh, South America and ended up in San Francisco. And he got to San Francisco and he immediately built another mercantile. And he, and he would buy and sell anything that anyone wanted to buy and sell. He was just trying to learn more about things. And, you know, from going from a small farm town to all of a sudden New York, Philadelphia, New Orleans, and now San Francisco, it had to be an eye opener. But as he's sitting there in San Francisco, he notices that he is buying and selling supplies and whatnot to the same people every day. And he just had a great feeling about them. And he wrote a letter to his mother. And he says, I don't know who these people are, but I know I'm going to spend the rest of my life with them. Well, he kept about his way. And then after about two months, these people who he befriended and everything, they showed up and they informed him that they were leaving, they were moving on. And they wanted to thank him for everything. And he must have had a shock look on his face. And they said, well, if you'd like, you can come with us. So that night, again, he sold everything and made the move with the, and left with this group of people. Well, what he didn't realize is they were the Mormon pioneers leaving, San, leaving California on their way to Salt Lake City. So he got to Salt Lake City. He felt like the only Jewish person within hundreds of miles, which, understandable. We're talking 1857 or so. And as he gets in Salt Lake, that picture, by the way, is him at a wedding photo. Um, I'll tell you about the ride in a moment. As he, got to San, as he got to Salt Lake City, he immediately felt lost and everything. And someone said, you ought to go talk to Alexander Niber. Alexander Niber was the first Jewish convert to the LDS church. And he was living in Salt Lake City, he was the first dentist in Utah and so forth. So he went to talk to him. And I don't know exactly why he continued to be friend with him. If it was for learning about the Mormons, or if it was because of other things, but Morris David Rosenbaum was baptized on March 27th, 1857. And the following day, he married Alexander Niebuhr's daughter. So I don't know which one of those two things kept him coming back. Well, and they had a family and so forth. And later on, as it was, you know, not an unusual custom in Salt Lake at the time, he took a second wife. And that's who this wedding photo is. That is his second wife. That is my great-great-grandmother. And that's Abigail Snow, the daughter of the prophet Lorenzo Snow. So it's Jewish history meeting Mormon history. Well, so what does this have to do with the Knowles Collection? Well, if you've done a lot of Jewish research, you'll notice that all of the records are very rarely in one location, one archive. In many occasions, they're in the uh, original synagogue, they're in local libraries, maybe a university, but they're scattered everywhere. You really have to go so many places. So I started compiling all the records of his life that I could 
and all the records of those people around him. So this is the death of his father, uh, David Rosenbaum, in 1857 in Forden. And you notice his uh, father died just shortly after he arrived in Salt Lake City. So he never saw his father again. And his mother died not long after that. Well, so I started compiling these records. There's the death of his parents and so forth, uh, hoping to put it all together. Well, it started to build into a bigger and bigger record, you know, a collection as we all have our, our databases of our own family history. Um, I, went, I went to various locations. I went to various archives. It was all a collection of records. So after it took 40 years, almost 40 years, to find the actual birth record of his. And there he is, David Moses, and his wife, Sarah, had a child, Moses. So this is in the traditional Jewish naming pattern. So he's Moses, son of David, and his mother, Sarah. So it took all this time to find this. So as I built the collection up and, you know, my own research, wanting to get it all together, I, did, I wanted to go and search for any records that may exist in England, in the British Isles, which took me to the Morty Collection. Now, the Morty Collection is a collection put together by a woman named Isabel Morty. She was a mathematician by trade, uh, and her she was Jewish. Her goal was just to compile the Jewish collection. Um, a couple of interesting things. She did all of her compiling of records, documenting of the Jewish people before home computers, before she died in 1981. So most everything she did was out of newspapers and that type of thing. She was very protective of this collection. She finally let the uh, Genealogical Society of Utah Family Search uh, microfilm it. But in order to do it, we had to promise to do it at her kitchen table. Little slips of paper, I'll show you in just a moment that she would load into the machine, she would close the machine and she would allow us to push the print button. As soon as the picture was taken, she would open it, she would take it off, put the next one on. So it took quite a wee while. But the Morty collection is a very difficult collection to search. It may be one of the most difficult. It consists of over 155 pedigrees. All of the records are linked by a numerical code. So she was a mathematician and she took advantage of that for this. It's about 7,500 people in the collection. It's very hard to research and it by no means is complete with everyone. And let me show you what I mean. These are actual cards that she put together. This is the index. Now, if you go to the very top one up there, you'll see Hannah Levy, and then it's got an, a code LL11.8.2, and then another code JD8.11. Well, the, the code, the LL, so the LL is the pedigree that Isabel Morty assigned it to. So everyone in LL is part of the same pedigree. The 11.8.2. So the first number, the 11, is the father's reference number in the previous generation. So we know he was number 11. The second number, the 8, is her generation number. So Hannah is in the 8th generation and the third number is the reference number within the generation. So her father was the 11th in his generation. She's the second in her generation, which is the eighth. Very confusing. But if you go down one to Judith, who happens to be her sister, we know that because she's 11.8.3. So the 11 would be her father's number. She's in the eighth generation, as, in, as is Hannah. And then the .3.2 um, doesn't necessarily relate them, but the first two numbers do. At the bottom is their brother, Abraham, who's 11.8.11. Now, this is another confusing fact about this. All the women within a generation were number 1 through 10. Males were 11 through 20. Females were 21 through 30. And it went on and on. Some generations had 160 people, so it just constantly rotate. It's, it's tricky to follow. But then in addition to that, the second code, the JD.11 and JD.12, those are the codes of their husbands. You notice she, they buried uh, the Joseph brothers, Abraham and Lion. So they married brothers. So that code then brings them into that pedigree. And there are a few extra notes on there. But you have to go through 
each film of these, each record, and tie them together with the pedigree code. It is time consuming and it, it, it's aggravating to say the least. In the family history library, we had a lady came in who was born in 18, or excuse me, 1970. So she was well with this. We found her in the collection and with all the code numbers, she had the opportunity to build her family tree. After about three hours of total aggravation of the time it takes, she just closed it up and said, it's not that important, which is sad. But this is the Morty collection there. Then the second step in the Morty collection, there are a group of individual records. Now this is from the Davis pedigree, which is pedigree D and the surname on it, Lemon. That's who married into the, the Davis pedigree. So you have Reginald Davis pedigree, uh, Davis, uh, D 12.10.31. And there it shows that she, he married in, on July 7th, 1892, Lillian Amy Lemon, the daughter of Henry, Le, Henry Lemon, who was a famous engraver. So we get a little more information, not a great deal. However, that is the only record. Oop. There we go. Sorry. So this is the only record in the Morty collection of a family last name Lemon. Lillian Amy Lemon, daughter of Henry Lemon, the engraver. So this is one of the big problems with the Morty collection. It was before records were accessible. So if you were to look at the Morty collection of all the Jews in England and you, lo you were looking for the name Lemon, you'd see two people. However, if you go to the 1881 census, there's Henry Lemon down about two thirds of the way. You see his daughter, Lillian A, and you see the other 12 siblings. None of them were included in the Morty collection. So all that linking of generations did not include this family. And so she died in 81, early 80s. So the 91 census was not available, the 01, the 11, and so forth. A lot of records were just not available to her yet, even if she could get down to watch, read them on microfilm. So there's a, a problem. Instead of two people, we have 13. And so I realized immediately I, I was not getting access to all the records of the Jewish people in the British Isles. So we made the Morty collection electronic so it could be searched. Now it took almost four years. That's how complex it was. But we made it as a searchable database that's totally available. But then other people, as I would be in London and talking to Jewish groups, they would say, hold on, you need to put our family in there as well. They're not included. So this picture here, this shows the Gluckstein family. This is a prime example of what the Morty collection leaves out and why we continued on. So the Glucksteins are a very prominent Jewish family, but if you were to search the Morty collection, there are no Glucksteins in the entire collection. Here is in Wilston Cemetery, I took these pictures. This is Isidore Glucksteen and his wife Rose. These are their headstones side by side. And is a, Wilston is maybe the most prominent Jewish cemetery for sure in the British Isles maybe in a lot of Europe, because it does include a lot of those who were fleeing Holocaust areas and so forth, and they came there. And it's, it's a beautiful cemetery, and it's, you know, it's been preserved. So you have Isidore and Rose Gluckstein. Well, just to show how we have to increase this. Now, here is the 1861 English census in Whitechapel, a very Jewish part of London. And you'll notice about halfway down, you have Isidore Gluckstein, and with them, you have Samuel and Hannah, his mom and dad, and then you have all the siblings, and then down at the bottom you start getting to uh, servants. Uh, like I say, a very prominent family. They started out as cigar makers and went into tea houses and everything. At one point, the Lion family, who this was as far as their business name, uh, they had almost 30,000 people working for them. So very prominent. But in the 1861 census in Whitechapel, there's the family. If you move on to 71, there they are again. Um, adds a few of the kids, you know, a few more that we didn't have before. You get to 81, and now here's Isidore and Rose, whose headstones are worse. So now he's moved out, started his own family, cigar manufacturer. And then, you know, he's got a, a daughter, two sons, a niece, and then new, a few servants. 91, the same type of thing, only now he's, he's at his parents' house, you know, traveling, whatever. 
Um, not sure the reason why he's there, but he's there. The Josephs who are right below him, those are siblings and so forth. 1901 census, there he is, his door again with his family. Um, like I say, it's very prominent families. Now this is director of a public company, which is the company he and his brother and his brother-in-law started. 1911 census, there he is again. So, you know, it, you, can tr you can trace the family all through the census records. Birth, marriage, and death records, here they are again. These are all just Gluckstein's. He's up there in 1850, his birth. So there's a lot of Gluckstein's. There was none of these in the Morty collection. But then it involves other records that you might not consider. So this is Jay Lyons and Company. This was the company they started in 1887. He and his brother and a brother-in-law. And they bought, they basically bought an empty company and so they could have the name Lyons. But uh, they were Gluckstein's and the brother-in-law was a salmon. But in their company website, this company has been out of business for about 30 years now. But in there, they keep an active company website where they list everyone who worked there. And they, in this case, here's the board of directors. And little profiles, pictures, this door's the one on top there. And then even further, they keep a list of who passed away, who used to work there. So these are all the Gluckstein's who worked there who were listed on the uh, records as having been deceased and their relation, you notice most of these are directors. Um, probably the thing that drove this family down is every new family member became a director and so they had too many chiefs and not enough Indians, you know, not enough people doing the work. But so this record gives you a date of death, it gives you all that information. Then the probate record, um, in 1920 he left 68,000 pounds in his will, he'd already given away most of it to family. Talks about how he died at the Grand Hotel. Well, they own the Grand Hotel. So he was staying there when he was on business and so forth. So if you take all those records now and link them together as families, this is the family tree that is now part of the Knowles collection. So there's six generations of that family in the Knowles collection whereas before there were none. Now, this is a great family because it tests all your research skills because it was very common in Jewish families to have cousins marry cousins. Um, it's not at all uncommon. And this family, uh, Isidore and his siblings, of the eight of them who I know who they married, six of the eight married first cousins. So it's a very common thing. It, uh, if you can tie in, it obviously makes your research very easier. Do two generations at once, or two families at once. But so this is how it looks now. The Gluckstein family is there. This is how it appears in the Knowles collection. Now, what other records? We went through one family. Let's just talk about some individual records that we've been able to access. Now, the first one I want to show you is just to show you that you know, we've everything we've looked at up until now has been very by the book. A census record, even though maybe, you know, not always accurate, maybe a little off on ages or so forth, it's a pr pretty easy record to follow. But also we have uncovered some family histories. Here's one. This was, uh, this was actually written by the family, and I will make no uh, comment on that, but Ben Burgunder started a tailor and manufacturing business. He married Carlin Friedman and never thereafter opened his mouth. I, the family submitted this. This is what the family remembered about him. But that's not, so family histories are part of this collection. This is civil registration of England. This happens to be the marriage record of Samuel Joseph and Kate Gluckstein. Um, again, they're marrying Josephs and Gluckstein's are all kind of intermarrying and the marriage was performed by the chief rabbi of the British Isles, a very prominent family. They got those kind of things. This is a great one. This is the Judah Magnus Museum collection. This is a library in Northern California. These are San Francisco marriage licenses that for the most part are pre-earthquake in 1807. 
They really exist nowhere else. We found them in our collection by accident, to be honest. But there's about six or 700 of these marriage licenses for Jewish families in the San Francisco area before the earthquake. So these records were able to be preserved where many weren't. And they're all part of the collection now. Now these are birth registrations of from England. We have these on film in the various languages. I put English in here on everything so we could all see it. This was the original civil registration and it was done by the Jewish people. As many will know, uh, civil registration in England started in 1837. Well, in the Jewish community, they felt a need to record their own information. They were, you know, a little turmoil, a little persecution, whatever. They felt the need to do it. So this is the actual birth registration. It's the first one there's from 12 July 1748. But what they did is they actually went back and recorded births of people. In the first case, he was born in 1707. Now, what's interesting about this, so in the front, you have these records of births. And then you'll notice the arrows on number six there. Uh, they have a number down the side. Well, if you go to the back of the birth registrations and follow those numbers, it will give you more information. Here's number six. So we have his birth, but now we know the parents married at the Jews Synagogue, St. Catherine Creek Church Parish, 24 May, 1721. The paternal grandparents were, and that is wife and where they were from, Portugal and so forth, Child born at the parents' lodgings gives you where they're at, and he gives you the, re the witness of the birth. So some of these records now, he was born in 1730s, and now we also know his parents and grandparents. So a lot of these are taking you back into the mid to late 1600s, which is just unbelievable. That's, that'd be 100 years before it became something that all of England did. So we have all those records. Now, what else do we have? We have headstone transcriptions. Um, been all over the world photo photographing headstones. Have about 250,000 of them right now. This is out of Los Angeles. But we have, so we have the headstone inscriptions where in this case on the left, you, know, you have the Hebrew and then on the left you have English and then you have the native tongue on the right. This was a three language one, most times it's two. In most cases, they put the native on one, Hebrew on the other. So this was in Los Angeles, the home of Peace uh, Cemetery. From the West Indies, same thing, Hebrew left, native tongue on the right. Then we have synagogue records that have been included. This is actually the marriage record from Forden. Now, this is the first marriage record from Forden after they began taking surnames. The Jewish people didn't take surnames until, uh, depending on where you were at, 1820s, early 1830s. But this very first marriage record that's recorded is actually uh, my great-great-grandfather's uncle. So that's Joseph M. Rosenbaum, married Rachel Samuel, gives the year 1824. He was 25. She was 22. Then it gives you the names of the parents. So he's Joseph M., his father's Moses Abraham, not Rosenbaum, but Abraham. So he was Joseph, son of Moses, and he adopted the surname Rosenbaum. His father was Moses Abraham. So his grandfather would have been Abraham something. And his wife was Rachel Samuel, and her father was Samuel, Samuel Nathan. So they, they also did the, road, you know, the accepting of names, but it's still in the traditional Jewish way. And as you look at these, about half of them, they've adopted their, you know, uh, both sides have his case. His father hadn't adopted it yet, may mean he was already deceased. It's hard to say, but so it's about that time frame they're taking surnames. This is a birth record out of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Now, this is 1877, and it talks about it gives the Hebrew date and everything. It does you the name of the person, and it gives you the father and so forth. And then the little comments at the bottom. Born in this island and omitted to be registered on account of hurricane, earthquake, and subsequently his mother's death. So this was, re he was born in 1867. It's recorded in 1877. So there's a lot of reasons. I think that's one reason we all want to do family history is to preserve the records, preserve our families. In this case, 
there was a chance it took 10 years to record it. Various census records, we all know the US census. This is Ireland. We have Irish census in here now where it identifies religion. In the fourth column, it identifies them as Hebrew. Um, so far, I found about 25 different ways they're recorded in the Irish census where the Jews are recorded different ways. My favorite one is attended Jewish church. So a little bit of everything. Great records, incredible records, but it identifies them by religion. And here's one out of the collection of family search, the 1869 Argentina census, whereas the uh, sixth column, it says they're Israelites, family there. Immigration records, this is a beautiful record. If you have Jewish family coming out of Philadelphia, once they acquired citizenship, they had the ability to petition for other family members to come over. So this person, um, Flora Witpupski Ackerman, in 1933, petitioned for her father, Louis Lieb Widupski, who was born, and it gives his date of birth and where he was born. And then she had to account for every day in his life from that day of his birth till the current date. And he resided. So it's like a roadmap of where he's traveled through Europe. He was born in Lithuania. He resided there until 1873 when he moved to Germany. And then he resided there until he, um, 1892 when he moved to a new place in Germany. Then in 1904, he moved to a new place in Germany. Now when name changes throughout Europe because of a war and everything else, it's possible some of those are the same place, but she had to account for it. But then she also had her mother in there and she did the same thing for her. So it's a roadmap of where these people live, which can help you find the records. And then it tells where they're provide where they're living at the bottom. So we know from his date of birth in 66 till the time of this in 33, almost 70 years, we know where he lived. And I mean, that's just very nice. And then, you know, here's a record, a uh, declaration of in, intention off ancestry. This is a, a group of Jews from Castoria, Greece, which is an incredible story of, you know, most of them ended up coming to Montreal. Um, but there's just a, a huge Greek history. So we have history of the Jews in Greece as part of this now. Um, we have Turkey, Egypt. We have the Knowles Collection has people from over 100 different countries. And then it has pedigrees. Now, these are absolutely amazing. These come from the Malcolm Stern Archive, which is at the American Jewish Archives in, in Cincinnati. But Malcolm Stern was maybe the foremost Jewish um, genealogist. He was a rabbi. So he would have people from all over the world send him information on their families, hoping he could help them. Some of them sent like this, which is an actual family tree. This is what the family sent him. And as you go through that, you notice there's five generations. Well, the top band of that tree is the fifth generation. And if you look at the names on there, you'll notice some of them have a letter, I, J, K, so forth. That means if you go to the letter J, the next couple sheets, that their tree continues on. If you're on family search, it's kind of like the arrow that says you have more family that goes on here. They give the date or the letter. So you can continue to follow these. Some of these are beautiful. This is the uh, same group. This is a group out of the Caribbean. But you can see it's all generations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven generations going up. And then as each branch comes out, those are the people within the collection. These are amazing records. Now, church records. So the obvious question is, why are church records, which is not a Jewish record, why are they in the Knowles Collection? Well, you know, it, we always talk about the Jewish people, wherever they lived. If they lived in Poland, you always check the Catholic records. Germany, the Lutheran records. Not because we think they converted or changed, but because whichever country whatever the uh, government religion was, it was usually their responsibility to record the birth, marriage, and death. So it was the Catholics in Poland who recorded the birth, death, and marriage records. They could have easily been recorded in a synagogue just as well, but you also check the native church if you can to see what's going on. Uh, let's get another copy of the record. Maybe it'll give a little more information. So this was in a Barbados church record that is part of family search. When you look at the original on micro, or the microfilm, 
it looks like someone actually cut and pasted in about six or seven pages. They don't look quite like the rest. It's at a little bit of an angle. Well, this is one of those. This entire page, which is out of Barbados church records, which is 95% Church of England, this entire page here is of Jewish burials, Jewish deaths. And if you go down there, you'll notice that there's four from the 10th of October, 1780. Um, Isaac was 78, another Isaac, 54, 3, 13, so forth. Well, this is all five deaths on the 10th of October, 1780, which the obvious thing we have to worry about is what was going on that caused five deaths. And to have someone actually put it in the church records to preserve the record, well, what it was is it was one of the largest hurricanes in history. Somewhere around 40,000 people were killed, um, hundreds of ships and everything else destroyed, uh, just off the co most of it off the coast of Barbados. So that takes us to the Knowles Collection. So there's Rosenbaum. You saw his wedding picture earlier. Now you see Mulder. Okay, so what is the Knowles Collection? The Knowles Collection contains over 1.4 million people. It's the genealogical records of over 1.4 million Jewish people. There's over 2,500 different sources from over 200 countries now. They're all linked as families. It's all name searchable. And the joy of it, it's all free. This picture is out of uh, Pierre Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. But it, records from everywhere, headstone pictures, cemetery pictures, whatever it is. So that's what it, it's 1.4. Now, it's built upon the foundation of the Morty Collection. That's where it all started. Those 7,500 names is now 1.4 million. Records are added almost daily. It grows by about 20,000 names a month. Most of the growth now is by the Jewish community submitting their original records. Uh, first, it was a lot of the family search collection being you know, indexed and combined as families. And now a lot of it is the actual Jewish community. So there are six databases as part of the Knowles Collection. The Jews of the British Isles, Jews of Europe, the Jews of North America, Jews of Caribbean South America, the Jews of the South Pacific, and the Jews of Africa, the Orient, and the Middle East. Uh, North America is the biggest. It's a little over 600,000 names. Europe's about 450. British Isles is 200. The rest are all about 50. But they're at it start where, you know, as we're adding more and more records there all the time. So just to show, this is just the data. I put this in today uh, just so you could be seen. Uh, this is the data from the North American file. There's 637,000 individuals, but yet if you go to the bottom, there's over 2.1 million source citations for those 600,000. Some people have as many as 100 source citations. So it's really just grown and grown and grown. But just the U.S. file has 600,000 with over 2.1 million citations. So how do we access the Knowles Collection? First off, there is a blog about it, the Knowles Collection.blogspot.com. And I put that up. We constantly put in articles and talking about records. But in the right-hand corner here, it says to search the Knowles Collection. That corner of this will always give you the current link and how to get there. But let me walk you through it. So here's Family Search. We're going to go up and click the Search button. And we're going to go down to Genealogies. So the collection is now under the Genealogies tab. And you go, and that takes you to this play, place. And we're under Community Trees. So you can put in a last name. Uh, you can change the search all right here. Now it says Community Trees. And I put the name Gluckstein in. We already talked about them. You can see how many are there. And I switched this to Community Trees. That just keeps it to search the Knowles Collection and not everything else. And this is the index that comes up. Now, where I said there were no Gluckstein family members in the Morty collection, just in the Knowles collection, there are now 407 people surnamed Gluckstein. And there's Isidore, who we showed in all those census records. Gives you the information, birth, death, burial. And if you click on him, it doesn't show well on the screen, but if you slide the bar up and down, it gives you all the sources. 
gives you information on it, and there is his tree. Now, it also tells you up here in the yellow bar that this one came from the Knowles Collection, the British Isles. So you know which of the six databases it came out of. So 400 members of the Gluckstein family, and it's all here, all searchable. And it gives you the sources down here. He's in 12 different sources. I hope this has helped provide a way, if you have Jewish family, a way to get access to records that maybe are harder to find, records you'd have to go to a synagogue to get, um, a little understanding of the Jewish process, if you will. Um, this is my email. I'm happy to answer any emails. And the blog address, uh, if you have any questions there. I, I hope you love... Grow to Love Jewish Research as much as I do. It's very fulfilling. It's wonderful. And there are ways, you know, to break through those family lines of your Jewish ancestors. Thank you very, very much. All right. Um, now is the question and answer time. Um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type those into the chat box um, and we'll answer those. All right, if we don't have any questions about the Knowles um, collection, um, then we'll just move on to our closing announcements. And just remember that you can um, contact Todd if you have any questions that pop up. Um, I will um, have a recording of this webinar posted to our YouTube and to our website so that you can um, take a look at the, his presentation again. Um, next Thursday, we won't have a webinar. Uh, it's, it's finals time here at BYU. Um, so uh, we'll be taking a break um, that Thursday. Uh, however, the 25th, we'll be hearing from James Tanner and he'll be giving a presentation on wars, plagues, catastrophes, and genealogy. Uh, so that'll be the 25th at 3 p.m. Mountain Time on Thursday. If you have any questions um, or concerns about webinars, you're welcome to email at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu uh, or see our website. Um, we are making some uh, new updates and improvements to our website in the soon future. Um, we're not sure the time frame for that, um, but just keep your eyes open. Uh, we are um, in the process of improving our website. Uh, you can catch us on social media. We have a Twitter and a Facebook. Uh, and of course, uh, we post regularly on our YouTube um, as well. So um, just remember, if you missed the beginning of this recording, it will be available next week when it gets updated. Uh, thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend.